kind of being just kind of plunk there. Um, the coach park that we were on was right around the corner from the stadium, literally not even two minutes walk from, from the side. It was underneath um, the train station that I got off at pretty much, I think. Yeah. Well, we, well, we were in a different one. We were in, it wasn't an official one that we were in, but there was all the Wigan coaches there, including the ones that took down the players, um, you know, family mm. and, and friends. Um, and so it was just like an old like unit, an old sort of warehousing space. But we were right around the corner and, as Alan said, you don't see it. You're kind of looking and you walk, and we literally walk around this corner and then, you know, kebab shops, barbers, you know, every kind of shop you can imagine, houses, apartments. And then on the left-hand side, just looked and it was like a, just like this gigantic spaceship had been plunked down. Because obviously, well, the thing is, White Hart Lane is still pretty much on the same site. I think it's like adjacent to where White Hart Lane, I think they were building yeah, it. Yeah, kind of like a quarter or a third of the space of it. The new stadium is where the old stadium was, isn't it? Sort of, yeah. Yeah, and, and obviously White Hart Lane's a, an old stadium, and I think at that time the football stadiums, rather than being out in the sort of suburbs where they are now built, at that time, you know, you look at the stadiums like Liverpool, Anfield, and everything at Goodison using football as an example. They're sort of right in the heart of the community, and that's what it felt like with with you know the the Tottenham Stadium. Yeah. It was, it's like this futuristic stadium just slap bang in the middle of you know the the population there so, but yeah we agree yeah with we both walked past like the local health center and stuff like that on our way just yeah. literally 20 seconds from the, from the gates to the stadium <laughs> yeah and it was just it was just phenomenal as you said you walk in and the, you know you go through the first bit of security like the airport scanners etc straight in 20 seconds no no mess and then you go through the next bit you know and then you go up the sort of concoursey bit and there's all the food places and the green area outside and then that's not even inside the stadium underneath like you said where you've got literally a bar that spans the entire sort of width of the stadium in the south stand so yeah top marks for the stadium it really is it's the best stadium i've seen rugby league yeah. in and i've been to quite a few over the last 37 years yeah and um beer prices being pretty basically the same as the as the pubs outside is is a big plus i think as well um yeah yeah, yeah. It, it, it felt reasonable. Like, like I didn't go to the bar and kind of go, "Oh, that's the flipping rip off." No, you know what food, I mean? food, pe- food felt difference. one pound more expensive than it should have been, but beers felt like the most reasonable pint I've bought in a stadium in London in my life. Compared to like nine quid for a crap beer at Wembley, you're paying six fifty for a nice beer. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Don't. Yeah. And don't forget with the Beaver Town as well, with the upside down cuts with the magnets in. I mean, that's worth a pound is it? on its own. Just watching that, I think I think I must have videoed it every time I went. I, I did, it. yeah, I did see a video you did of that. Um, then, as, as you were as we were arri- arriving at the ground, sort of midway through the eighteen ninety five game, the team news came out, and the big shock on the team sheet, David, of, of Tommy Lulu being named. I thought he was only in the twenty one as kind of a. Um, a kind of a I don't know emotional thing you know uh, that kind of yeah. element to it but no we actually got named in the match day 17 how did you feel when you saw Tommy's name on that list so I I, I, I was in the stands and I was sat near um, Phil Wilkinson he used to be the re- uh, writer for Wigan Observer and Wigan Post um, you know yeah. and, and he covered rugby league for so long he's been on SLT he many years ago yeah yeah and, and, and I saw him and I, you know I always have a chat with him you know about every, how everything's going he's like I'm oh, not really he said I've not been able to follow it with work he's working at university now and he was like i am not really been able to follow it he went but what about Tommy being named in the squad and I didn't think it was an emotional thing you know because whatever happened in you know Tommy Lilo I you know six weeks ago was told it was out for three months so you know even on even on the final preview you're like yeah well we know that Tommy Lula is not playing and also I think you said that Farge would be playing so you you know you struck out there yeah. right? but um, I, I didn't think that they would put him in as an emotional sort of crutch because it, it, it was obviously going to be part of the squad all week. It would obviously be, you know, speaking with the likes of um, Brad O'Neill and, and Harry Smith and, and giving them the experience. So I, I, I didn't see what benefit putting him in the 21 would be, you know, anyway. So I thought, you might have a chance here, you know. I, I didn't see the benefit of it because it's just taking, all right, you, you're not really taking up a space because, you, you know, you trim your squad down anyway, you know, closer to the game. But... Yeah, just to see his name on there, I think lifted everybody. And I think when I spoke to Phil, he was I was said, well, if he's if he's fit, get him on the bench. He's not going to do any harm, you know. We do. Joe Shorrocks was probably the person that would have took that bench spot anyway. So we had some, um, you know, cover for Brad because he's still a young lad, isn't he? At the end mm. of the day, 
but it just, I think it just lifted the fans. It just was like, oh my, oh wow. And and with the, with all the other things that were going around as well, once we knew that Farge wasn't playing, things were just sort of like stacking up in Wigan's favour and you're thinking, oh, making you believe a little bit more and, and that certainly added to that. Then, Alan, you probably had a better view of this than we did, but just before kick-off, some last gets out on the roof. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because... So where I was sat, I was sat next to um, uh, Tottenham, a Tottenham fan actually, um, which is another story in in, in of itself. Um, so I, I, I'll mention it now b- before I go on to talk about the last on the roof. Um, so yeah, so I was sat next to um, a Tottenham fan who had never been to the ground before, because um, I asked him, so are these like your regular seats? Have you kind of booked the same seats? And he said, "Well, to, to be honest with you, we, we've never been able to come before." And I kind of, I kind of assumed that's because he couldn't afford to come, if that makes sense. Yeah, um, or like it's oversubscribed or, for or what circumstances yeah. or whatever. Yeah. So, so he was there with his son and his dad, and it was just nice. They'd never seen a game of rugby league before. Um, his son was probably about seven or something like that. Plays rugby union for kind of uh, for Saracens in kind of one of their feeder kind of junior teams, I guess. Um, but yeah, so he was kind of he was asking questions about the game and all this kind of stuff, and they had a general understanding. But yeah, it was his first ever game, um, so there, there were some new fans in the stadium. It wasn't just it wasn't just uh, people coming from, from the north, uh, yeah, know, from the north and, and kind of established fans, which was which was nice. It was nice to talk to him and, and, and talk to him. But yeah, so I, I was I was a bit distracted. I was kind of just um, I wasn't really paying attention. And then he kind of says, "Look up there." <laughs> <laughs> and then literally like like she cuz they said like she was going to be talking on the um or singing from the sky plane or sky skywalk skywalk that was it and i was like well i can't see anything I, I, i've no idea where that is and i thought it might be on in that kind of in the glass boxes on the other side or whatever i had absolutely no clue that they were going to put somebody on the no. <laughs> on the roof uh, next to the uh next to the uh, tottenham uh, symbol um so yeah, it, yeah, I think that was kind of, yeah, it, it kind of, it added to the atmosphere, particularly after kind of abide with me and stuff, which was also, which is always great, and I always love that. Yeah, um, yeah, it was, yeah, it, it, I think the atmosphere was as, as kind of kickoff was coming up was, it was really good. It was really good. I thought um, people were really getting behind it, and and you know the the atmosphere was definitely building. Yeah, definitely. And people were like being blown away by different things in the stadium and, and stuff like that. Um, right, game gets underway pretty quickly, David. We find ourselves 2 0 down. Brad Singleton goes barreling into a defender, and, and Kate Cust wasn't allowed to take advantage, which, fair <laughs> enough, I think. 2 0 down pretty quickly. Did you, any any nerves start to settle in at that stage? No, I, I, you know, I, I, I didn't feel that. So I'll come to when the nerves kind of kicked in a little bit later, but. Early on, you know, give away a penalty and, you know, 2 0 down, you, you, it's one of those, isn't it? Huddersfield got the scoreboard ticking over, which is always important. But at that point, it was still too early to kind of see what, the way the, the land lies. Obviously, Wigan then proceeded to gift Huddersfield possession with just ridiculous knock ons and, and invited the pressure on. So, no nerves at that stage. It, it, was, it was still very much both sides were feeling each other out, I think, at that point. Yeah, no, nothing had really happened, did it? I think the first thing that nearly happened was um, Wigan got a penalty for the Giants being offside six minutes into the game. And actually, it was Wigan's first attacking set of the game, probably the first attacking set of the game from both sides. And Jay Field puts a kick in midway through the tackle count, just a bit overcooked. If he'd have landed it right, Lee, Liam Marshall would have scored that try he scored at the end, right at the start. Yeah. So Wigan's first attack actually looked, looked threatening. Um, but straight away after it had gone out into touch the referee balances up the penalty count with an offside for Wigan he, he sets down his store which is totally fine uh, that was 8 minutes in and that led to what 15 minutes of Wigan just fucking up completely <laughs> consistently the first there was the knockdown from McGilvery on the pass out to Mc, uh, knockdown from Marshall on the pass out to McGilvery that actually yeah. arguably saved a try then yeah. from that uh, ben French makes a great tackle putting in his senior into touch, which was f- helped by a great inside push from particularly John Bateman, but all the scrum defenders came out very quickly and, and covered that. And so that was a sign of Wigan's strong defence early doors. Um, 
Wigan got up the other end of the field ish, and ba- John Bateman was offside, wasn't he, from that kick by yep. Harry Smith? That Lola here couldn't get anywhere near, but he was just a few yards in front, so the referee had had to blow up. So that was the feeling each other out stage, and then. 12 minutes into the game, Ian Thornley got hurt like literally a yard away from the play of the ball, but time wasn't called off. Lola here kicked through on tackle three, himself actually tackle three. Harry Smith gets to it, sets up a goal line dropout. I actually thought from that goal line dropout, just as a side, that that senior knocked on. I think he knocked the ball into Latelli's back before he caught it, but no one saw it, so maybe I'm I'm wrong. Um, but this is when it really started to feel like Huddersfield was starting to get the pressure on, on didn't it, David? Yeah, there was... Uh, I think they had maybe, you know, with the penalties and the knock-ons, I think there was a time where it felt like they must have had possession sort of three or four times on the bounce. And, you know, I was still relatively calm at this point because I knew that Wigan were going to get some territory get I, don't, I think we'd only had like one set in the Huddersfield half at that point so I knew we were going to get some possession get some territory and calm ourselves down a bit so when you when you're in the ascendancy so much um you know particularly in a final you've really got to make that pressure count um yeah. Huddersfield came with a game well Huddersfield came with a game plan which the you know Ian Watson's side are always well drilled I think he's been a very astute uh, acquisition to get for Huddersfield to get him because he, you know he sort of goes through the finer details and they had the game plan I think they stuck to it possibly a bit too rigidly at time I mean I don't know how many times they went for the power play on the last tackle but it felt like pretty much every time they got the last tackle they were happy to just turn the ball over with Wigan just you know five meters from the line or so so yeah it was still the, the, the game was getting into the swing of things there and you know Huddersfield were definitely in the ascendancy yeah, this is where that sort of period started, didn't it? There was Marshall had the knock on from a, a poor dummy half pass at, just after Chris Hill had gone close. Then yeah. um, Harry Smith knocked on at dummy half, led to that messy scrum where Smith actually forced a knock on out of Daniel Levi, but um, the referee said Smith had gone early, differential penalty given, fair enough. Um, and that at possession, when Wigan had had three chances to clear the line and kept making mistakes. Um, yeah led to the Latelli try. So clever swap of position, I thought, between Latelli and Jones, that Jones came from the centre position with a dummy runner and that kind of held the line enough for Latelli to power over. Uh, the kick was missed. Um, what did you make of that first try, Al? Obviously, it wasn't the first time that they'd fared to Latelli, was it? And, you know, you know, as, as David said, you know, they it felt like Latelli ended up with the ball in his hands a heck of a lot and a lot of those times were on the fifth tackle um as it happened yeah that the, the, he he's probably one of your your skill mismatches isn't he against Thornley you you would say um yeah so you know he, he's a strong he's probably you know especially he, with Thornley at this time have having that knee uh, yes not in perfect nick so he's I understand why they kept feeding him because he is the kind of player who can make something happen when you're being quite conservative which they were they, they were definitely conservative in game plan um the, the obviously the advantage of, of handing the ball over is you're not giving the ball to French or, or field in space are you mm, um, yeah so so it, it makes sense from that point of view and it just so happens that that uh, Latelli made something happen when he when he got the ball in hand, um, which he couldn't quite do to the same extent again. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it was a yeah, it was it, it was a very good try um, um, in terms of the finish, um, kind of what you we come to expect from him, frankly. Wigan were down then six 0 at that point, six, 16, 17 minutes on the clock. Then came the next big moment of the game was around nineteen twenty minutes. Chris Hill got hurt. Um, it did go down, get back up, and then go down again once he'd got into the defensive line. So I think from a Wigan fan's perspective, I don't know if you felt the same, David, but I thought, what the fuck's going on here? There was no time off at all when Thornley was down, but Chris Hill's gone down and they're blowing time off straight away when Wigan have just made 30 metres in two tackles. And then he falls down and they blow time off. But actually, I think he'd been struggling for about 30 seconds or so before that. It just felt so frustrating at the time when I didn't see that um, but yeah. do you think that was a momentum swing back to Wigan with Chris Hill going off big player big experience as well yeah absolutely I mean I didn't see him go down the first time but when I saw him go down the second time and I saw the physio you know he, the, he did the roll forward as if to say yeah he's mm. got to come off and 
I think that, again, when we talk about signs and things going in Wigan's favour, that's definitely, you know, 